Religion. What is religion? Well, it's our life. We're told that religion is our life. So what is our life? Our life is what we do and what we love. What we love is what we tend to do. So here's a sentence for you. Why we do what we do, and why we love what we love, and what we live for is our religion. A mind bender, I suppose. You kind of say, oh, that makes sense, kind of. So what is your religion about? Or what is your religion? You can't say a new church, you can't say Swedenborgian, you can't say Christian whatever your faith is. Those are denominations under which you learn and practice and gather in community, but what is your religion? The word religion is a word that means to tie back or to bind something together or connect you. So religion connects us with God and connects us with other people. So you could ask, are you feeling connected to God and other people? Do you feel like your religion's alive and so you're connected to God and to others. And if your answer is, if not, then maybe your life isn't matching your loves at the moment, or your loves do not match your Creator's plan, perhaps, or your actions do not connect you with the Lord, and maybe we're missing the point of religion. As we're told, all religion has relation to life, and the life of religion is to do good. A question I hear often in different ways, different phraseology says, how can I tell if I'm going to make it to heaven or not? Anyone ever asked, you ever asked that question of yourself? I wonder if, if there is a heaven, if I'll make it to heaven, am I living the right kind of life? Some people think to themselves that, well, I couldn't possibly make it to heaven because I did this or I was like this when I was growing up or I made these mistakes. Well, heaven is a reflection of the Lord. And the Lord is all loving, the Lord is all wise, nothing else. So are we doing things that are a reflection of the Lord's love and wisdom? That's one way to think about it. Another way to say it, are we behaving like residents of heaven would behave? And are we behaving this way because we want to do what's right? Not because we want to seem to others to be a good person so that they feel good about us or trust us, that kind of thing or we don't want to do it to influence other people, or because we're afraid. So why do we do it? So knowing, only knowing about heaven and about living a spiritual life doesn't do it either. We have to actually walk the walk of spirituality. So here's a passage that says this, heaven is granted only to people who know the path to it and follow that path. We can know the path to heaven to some extent simply by considering what pe the people who make up heaven are like. Realizing that no one can become an angel or get to heaven unless he or she arrives, bringing along some angelic quality from the world. Inherent in that angelic quality is a knowing of the path from having walked it and a walking in the path from the knowing of it. So we have to know something about what that kind of life is like and we have to have walked it to some degree. We know about the path. It's sort of the circular thing. Well, you know it, you walk it, and when you walk it, you know it, that kind of thing. And it grows and grows as you do that. So simply put, our life is about doing what is good. Not thinking about it only like, oh, that would be really nice if I did that, but yeah, I don't want to do that. I'll just stay here. Or doing what we imagine is good. We actually have to find out, is this good and useful? So we have to learn about what's good and true. And we have to avoid doing things that are selfish, hellish, evil, you might say. Avoid doing bad things and purposefully doing what's good. That's the life of religion. So I'm going to stop doing things I know I shouldn't do, and I'm going to try to do what is good and right. So two weeks ago, if you were here, we talked about the disciples fishing all night after the Lord's resurrection, and they caught nothing. And then a man appears on the shore, as we talked about with the kids, and he said, cast a net on the right side of the boat and you'll catch some. And they've been fishing all night, and they're like, oh, okay, we'll give it a shot. They did it, and they pulled in 153 fish, it says, 
And they realized at that moment, oh, that's got to be the Lord. So they quickly came to shore, and it was him. And he invited them and served breakfast to them, and they sat down together. We talked about how fishing on the right side is doing things from love, doing things inspired by love. Doing things on the left side of the boat is trying to do it all from our head, all from our mind, intellect, and so forth. So doing things from love. That's what the Lord said will allow you to draw people to the church, will help you to help people is doing it from love. So on the shore, Peter is asked by the Lord, do you love me more than these? And I don't know what he's talking about because no one has specified and I can't figure it out. It's like, do you mean the other, do you love me more than the other disciples love me? Do you love me more than the fish and the bread? But he's saying, do you love me more than these? And Peter says, well, you know that I love you. And he says, feed my lambs. And he asks him again, do you love me? He says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He says, tend my sheep. He says the third time, do you love me? And Peter's starting to get agitated by this, annoyed by this, like, Lord, you know that I love you. And he says, then feed my sheep. So Peter's interrogated by the Lord. And why, do you, why is the Lord doing this? Why is Peter being interrogated by Jesus? It's because Peter, in the Lord's word, symbolizes or pictures our faith, our belief in God, how we live according to our religious life. And our faith is has a variety of faces, and you can see that reflected in the way Peter behaves. You can see that sometimes Peter has it dead on, he's doing the right thing, and sometimes he's missing the mark entirely. Kind of like what we go through, right, in our spiritual life, is sometimes we feel like we have it right, sometimes we're connected, and sometimes we're way off. And sometimes we feel disconnected from God, sometimes we feel like we have it right. So, of course, there's a story when Jesus was arrested, Peter denied the Lord three times. He said, I don't know him. Sometimes our faith is afraid to stand up for what it believes. When the Lord appeared on the shore in this story, Peter dove right in because he knew and he wanted to get there right away. He was anxious to be with the Lord. Sometimes our faith is strong. When the Lord asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And the Lord said, yes, well said, Peter. Blessed are you, Simon you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. So the Lord is praising Peter for his answer. And a moment later, the Lord tells them that he will be taken, arrested, and crucified, and rise again. And Peter says, no, Lord, this will never happen to you. And the Lord says, get thee behind me, Satan, to Peter. So Peter's like, great. And he's wrong. Right? So our faith is like that. Sometimes we've got it, sometimes we don't. So our faith can be inclined to think that it has it right because in our minds we understand what's true and we think we understand how to live our life. But the problem is our faith can be tricked into thinking just knowing is enough or that knowing is living. And that's called faith separate from charity or faith alone. The Lord calls it that, that dragon, the serpent of old that deceives the world. It's very alluring because we can be tricked into thinking, well, you just have faith. If you just have faith, everything is good. The Lord's trying to say faith is how you live according to your religion. It's not just something that you believe. And it's interesting, we struggle with that all of our lives. The children of Israel, in all of their battles in the Holy Land, they were fighting the Philistines. Our Philistines kept showing up and fighting them. They just couldn't get rid of them. And the Philistines symbolize faith separate from a life of charity. So the Lord is saying you're going to struggle with this in your life thinking that you have it right in your head and believing just because you know it that you're living by it. So our faith is wavering throughout life and Peter is interrogated to remind us that the point of our faith is that we may live to perform uses and to serve each other. That is what living faith is. It's focused on love and kindness and usefulness. It's not on knowing and understanding only. And a big part of it too is Peter picture as faith means that our faith ought to instruct those who are interested. Like, feed my sheep. Feed the people that want to know about this stuff. Feed them. Absolutely. Truth is important to share. It's important for us to know so it can guide our choices. Ask ourselves questions. Does this align with what's true? Like, what's the greater good in this situation that I can do? What's the right thing to do? To give and to share and to nourish and to help others. So to love people is to perform useful service. The Lord says if we 
If we don't live by our faith, it just, use an example, it's like, you know, dandelions, which are starting to grow, when they get dried out and they just have that little puff ball, it's like, those things, that's the description of what happens to our faith if it's not lived. It's just an airy nothing that dissipates, that blows away. So I love that the Gospel of John ends this way. The Lord's, Lord's saying, make sure you know that it's about tending to each other. It's about loving each other. And then there's this little conversation that happens between the Lord and Peter. The Lord says, follow me to Peter, and he does. And then he turns and sees John, the disciple, and says, well, what about him? <laughs> Shouldn't he follow you also? Is kind of what he's thinking, I think. And our faith tends to turn from what the Lord from the Lord and worry about what someone else is doing. Like how often do we worry about what other, someone else's faith is like, well, that's not right. Your faith is wrong. And so we like, what about them? The Lord says, don't worry about him. You follow me. The Lord says, John's fine. Don't worry about John. And why does he say that about John? Because of what John pictures. John pictures charity in action or good works. If we are actually living by our faith and doing good things, the Lord says, you're fine. Don't worry about John. John's got it together. <laughs> you, faith, follow me. So the Lord wants us to get involved in caring for one another, to live a life of love, a life of good, a life of religion, a life of doing and acting. And then he says this one other thing. He says, when you were young, you went where you wanted, and when you were older, others will clothe you and lead you around where you don't want to go. What's that about? That's about when a church at its beginning is, shall we say, very focused on life, very focused on giving and doing and caring for other people. It's enthusiastic about that. When you're young, when we get old, we fall into, can fall into faith alone. We can divide into arguments. Churches tend to slip away from the loving each other to, well, what's your belief? Well, that's not right. What's your belief? If you look in the directory, how many different churches are there in, let's just say, this county that are Christian, so-called, right? Tons of them, different, because they're divided, because, well, your faith, no, that's not right. Let's start another church. So we're all divided because the focus is on beliefs rather than life. The Lord said if we were focused on charity and love, all the churches would be one. So churches tend to get divided because of that. We fall away from living to thinking. And we talked about two weeks ago, fishing on the right side of the boat. It's about coming from love. It's a, that's what doing it right is, doing it from love and kindness. Feed my sheep, tend my sheep. So think about this in relation to a marriage or a loving relationship. If you want your relationship to be rich and rewarding, what should you do? Buy lots of flowers, lots of chocolate, what's Go on nice trips. What's, what's the answer? Two things. One, love the Lord more than anything else. And the second thing is get spiritual. <laughs> Follow the teachings of your faith. Because it makes you a better person, a kinder person, a more loving person. I like to talk to couples who I'm counseling and saying, you know, um, I don't want to say better couples, but it's kind of the word I use, is better couples make better marriages. Meaning if you're, nice, if you're nice and kind and loving, you're going to have a better relationship than if you're big, fat, you know what. <laughs> you know? Treat each other well. That will make it work. Examine your life. Shun evils in your life when they show up. If you're being selfish, cut it out. Notice that in yourself and stop. That's what brings people together. The Heavenly Doctrine says, Love for the Lord is nothing but applying the precepts of the word to our lives, these precepts being essentially to abstain from evil things because they're hellish and demonic and to do good things because they're heavenly and divine. Pretty simple in that respect. Quit the negative, do loving things. Feed my sheep, tend my sheep. Nourish, care for them. A garden with no care or water or attempts to fertilize it, what happens to it? It becomes a disaster, right? We have to tend to it. So looking at this, another passage from the Heavenly Doctrine says, the states produced by conjugal or married love are innocence, peace, tranquility, inmost friendship, complete trust, a mutual desire of the mind and heart to do the other every good. 
Also, as a result of all these, so if you do that, what happens? You have bliss, felicity, delight, pleasure, and owing to an eternal enjoyment of states like this, the happiness of heaven. To me, the punch of that passage is do the other every good. It's a verb. Love is a verb. It's action. Love is not a feeling. Yes, the feelings of love are wonderful. They show up. It's great when they show up, but they show up when we are loving. If you pay attention to your feelings only, you'll say, well, this isn't going to work. This relationship's over. <laughs> I don't feel loving towards them right now. Of course, we all want to feel the warmth of love, right? We want to feel good and that we're connected, but those things will come when we live in a loving way, when we act in a loving way. And some sad feelings can arise in your relationship when you feel like your partner's not doing loving things. Sort of like the conversation with Lord and John, or Lord with Peter, do you love me more than these? Imagine this conversation in a relationship. Do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than your guitars, Dave? <laughs> well, you know that I love you. Well, you really love me more than you love food? Yes, you know that I love you. Do you really love me more than you love the show that you're watching right now on your, your iPad? Well, then feed my sheep. Be loving. It takes effort and attention to tend and to feed to love someone takes effort and attention. It takes doing something, not just saying, you, you know I love you. Like how, how satisfying would that be to you if you said to your partner, you, do you love me more than these? And you say, oh, you know I love you. Like, well, why do you think I'm asking? <laughs> I'm not, not sensing it. If they know that when we act, people know because our actions speak louder than our words. How are we doing the other every good when possible? It takes living by our faith. So this week we are focusing on doing our religion. All religion is of the life, and the life of religion is to do what is good. So what are ways that we can do what is good? Well, part of it is how we think of others. How do you think of people that you encounter? Because, you know, they can't see your thoughts. But it's more than just how you behave. It's what do we think about them? It's not only doing well, but it's wishing well for other people. So that's part of it. But what words do we say? Are they kind? Are they useful? Are they necessary? Are they fair? Are they uplifting? Are they nourishing? If we need to be constructive, how can we do it in a way that is balanced and kind and fair? The golden rule comes to mind. How would I like to be engaged with about this issue? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. How would I like to be approached if this person had an issue with me about this? Actions can also be as simple as our facial expressions. Do we smile at people? Do we look at them in the eye? Do we acknowledge them? At the grocery store, I like to shop, I like food. Do we offer to take someone's cart back to the store? Like, let me help you out. Let me take that. Or someone's trying to reach on a high shelf. Can I reach up and help them out? Simple things you can do that are really just kind and helpful. But that's the kind of thing we're thinking about. How do I become aware of the people around me? And how do I think of them and serve them? One thing we can do when we're going shopping is just buy a sandwich at the deli there. And when you pass... Inevitably, someone who's on the street who's asking for something, you can give them something to eat. You thought about it ahead of time, you're ready to do it, you can help them. You're not giving cash, you're giving food, something that is useful at that time. Open our eyes, open our heart, open our hands. How can we serve? So Jesus was just trying to be clear to us, to his church, to Peter, our faith. Your faith is about caring for one another. Tend the sheep. Love the sheep, love the lambs, tend them, feed them, care for them. So the Lord is about to leave the church in their hands. So he's trying to say, let's get this straight. It's about mutual love. It's about caring for each other. And how do we love the Lord? By loving each other, by caring for each other. Love one another as I have loved you. So I end with an um, interaction I observed on an airplane. There was a father and a daughter 
next to me on the plane, and they're having a political, political discussion with each other. And she accused him of lacking compassion because of his views, or shall, how she saw his views being lived out or not lived out. And he replied, well, I care. And she asked him, well, what are you doing? And he was arguing for the rightness of his position, and she was arguing for the need for a response to clear needs around him of other people. So rightness, having a right idea was to her not what was important. What are you doing? And it's kind of hard to argue with that, right? What are you actually doing with your beliefs? Political, religious, whatever. What are you doing with them? Amen. I open the floor now if anyone has any prayer requests. Um, Jeff and Mary Carr asked for prayer. Jeff had surgery on his foot and 